That's, um, and that's what the church is, a family who's bound together by the, love of, by the love of God. Thank you for being here this morning, and uh, I know there are quite a few folks who are ill, and I won't try to mention all those names, but uh, I will give you an update on Ms. Rebecca. She's not listed as being in the hospital because when the bulletin was printed this week, we were... Uh, they were thinking she was going to go home, but she's not home. Back, she's still in the hospital, has pneumonia and a lot of congestion. And uh, I know a number of you have asked me about visiting. Uh, if you have any kind of problems physically, you shouldn't visit her or anybody in the hospital right now. It's, it's just not a good, smart thing to do. And then if you visit her, uh, it's good to just keep your visit very short. She's, she's having a lot of depression, a lot of congestion. I just talked with Teresa on the phone a few minutes ago, and so uh, uh, she needs a lot of prayer. When you've lived with somebody 70-plus years, it's a very difficult experience. Uh, none of us really understand that, but when you know that you, they're not coming home, that, that's tough. And so keep her in her family, if you would, in your prayers. And then uh, <coughs> Debbie Alt is going to be having some heart tests done on Tuesday uh, at CMC in Pineville. And we certainly want to keep uh, her in, in, your, in your prayers. And Ken Kushka uh, may be having some surgery this week. Not sure. Ken's not here today. He's not doing well, Joanne says. And so uh, he especially needs your prayers also. All right. Let's come together around the altar and pray this morning, okay? These as well as others. Pray for your country. Your country needs your prayers. Amen? Amen. Never seen it more desperate than it is today, to be honest with you. Very glad that Mary is able to be here this morning. Amen. First time in some weeks. And she's making some progress. Father, uh, we're family. And your word tells us that when one of us rejoices, then we must all rejoice. And when one of us weeps, we must all weep together. Because we are one in the bond of love. And I can honestly say, Father, one of the great, great blessings of, of our lives is the privilege of being part of this family that we call the Union Baptist Church. There are a lot of needs, Father, physically. And uh, you know each of our concerns. You know the names that are listed on the, the prayer request list this morning. But um, just, just simply want to especially pray for Miss Rebecca and Teresa and... Uh, that family, just just surround her with your love this morning. We do trust, Father, she's going to improve so that she might be able to return to her home. And uh, somehow, Father, and I know this, this is possible, I know it happens, that when we pray for her and we're some miles away from her, that the Holy Spirit of God can just somehow tell her she's being prayed for this morning. And Father, to her, that's very important. Lift her spirits. Just uh, break loose that, uh, that depression that seems to have settled in upon her. And then, Lord, I pray for Miss Debbie. We, we're so glad that Bobby's here this morning, and, and um, we've missed him, and we're just so grateful that he's in our presence today. And I know that that she's especially grateful in light of the fact that she's having some, some problems. And I pray for the doctor who performed the test on Tuesday. I pray you'd guide his, his hands and give him the proper diagnosis. And then I pray for uh, Bobby and David McCarter who've gone yonder to CMC in, in Charlotte this morning to be with a friend who's 
critically ill in a, in a car accident, I pray you'd bless that family this morning. Then, Father, I pray for our country. I mean, any right-thinking person, when they look out at the political scene of America right now, just, just has to shake their heads and say, how can this be in a country like ours? And, Lord, the answer does not lie in the election of new president or new congress. I, I know a lot of people are putting, putting a lot of stock in everything's going to change come January 20th, of night of 2016. But, for, Father, we know better. It doesn't rest in the hands of the politicians. It all rests in the hands of the people of God, like us who gather in a church like this this morning and all across our country. And, Father, I believe with all my heart that even though it's an Old Testament passage, I, I do believe that it is an answer, and the answer, the answer to America's dilemma today, if Ray Long will humble himself. That's hard. You've given us so much. We've become so independent of you. And so it's a, it's, it's a rather unique thing for a person to just recognize that we don't have anything without you. Our armies can't even save us. We may have the best military in the world, but Father, that military can't save us. In very long, will humble himself and he'll pray in the manner of the New Testament teachings of the model prayer and mean that. And if he will turn from his wicked ways and he will seek the face of God, that is, that nothing else is more important than the kingdom of God and the will of God, then you have promised, and you, never, you have never failed to keep a promise, then you've said you will hear his sin, his prayers. You will forgive his sins. You will begin to use him as an instrument in this church and other places to bring about revival. Father, I pray that with all my heart, God, whether it happens in any other church. Father, I pray, oh, how I pray it will happen in Union Baptist Church. And then, Lord, when that happens, we'll become salt and light. We'll become something else. We'll, we'll become the door to the kingdom of God for the unchurched and the unsaved. God, we need to be that. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be here this morning. Again, there's some that, that could not be here due to illness or other reasons. But then, God, there's some who are just negligent. They're just lazy when it comes to the things of the kingdom of God. There's some, Father, who've let the things that you've given them distract them from serving the God who's made all of it possible. God, I just pray you'd forgive them this morning. I just pray the Holy Spirit will make them so un. Un, just so miserable that they can't enjoy what they're, they think they're going to enjoy today. Lord, I don't pray that in a mean spirit. But God, how your heart must grieve when you look down on this congregation and congregations all across America and realize that there are members who are elsewhere when they ought to be in this place or that place to worship you this morning. And so, Lord, it's not a mean spirit. It's a spirit of concern and love. And I pray that your spirit would move upon their hearts this morning. Father, if there's somebody here this morning who's never come the way of Jesus, I pray that today salvation will come to that house. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 things straight that's that's why we've got Greg here to keep me straight <laughs> thank you Greg we do have a responsive reading and I think that's important so stand back up and let's uh, have our responsive reading of Psalm 19 this morning you can <clears throat> use your bulletin or you can use the screen behind me the heavens the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. The 
which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. <coughs> Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, Father. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the word of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. Remain standing.
as individuals and as the congregation, as the church, that we will be your light shining in the world and that we will bring others to Christ. They might explode from the beauty and everything that we do. One of the ways, oh Lord, that we can do that is through these offerings that we give today and we pray that bless them abundantly as they will be used for your service wherever that, that may be here in our, our neighborhood, our community, or somewhere in the world that it will be used for your glory and for your service and to win others to Christ and to spread your word. And all of this we pray in your name.
midst of last week at home. That's rare for me. Um, and so that just gave me a lot of time to pray and think. And so you're in trouble this morning. <laughs> uh, really, you know, it just pays some time just to be still and know that he's God. But I... Uh, <laughs> I really appreciated uh, uh, Greg selecting Send the Light. It, amazing how the Holy Spirit works. I, uh, this message this morning I worked on this week, and, and uh, I suppose about middle of the week, I began to sing that song. There's a call comes ringing over the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. Uh, and when I saw that on the order of service, I thought, well, my God's good to just sort of merge things together. And, um, I, um, um, how many of you have got those, those calls the last couple of weeks? So he, if the election were held, man, I've, heard, I, I've had that call so many times, I could do it myself. Uh, it's a robocall, you know that. How many of you have had one of those calls? If the election were held today, who would you vote for? How many? Seriously. Well, they must have just called me <laughs> all the time. Well, to confuse the polls, I have voted for everybody. <laughs> who are you going to vote for today? I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Next day they call again, who are you going to vote for today? Well, I'm going to vote for Dr. Carson. Get them, get them messed up. <laughs> no, I've been pretty consistent. And uh, if you want to know who to vote for, just see me after service, I'll tell you. <laughs> but uh, I don't know about your call, but one of the calls that, uh, uh, one of the questions that's, that, uh, well, I've gotten two or three different polls but one of them is, how often do you attend church? You know, do you attend uh, once a week, or do you attend t two or more times a week, or do you, turn, do you attend, I can't remember all of it, but, uh, you know, they ask those questions. Uh, I don't know what that's got to do with it, really, but they do. They always ask, ask a question about you, and then they always ask a question about well, how old you are. If you're a certain age, they just don't pay you any attention. They just cut you off. But the po it's very interesting that, that seriously they are interested in how often people attend church. Well, you know that, and I'm going to tie this into the sermon in a moment, uh, but you know that they tell us that in York County, which is part of the Bible Belt, that about 70% of the people rarely if ever attend church. That, that's really staggering to my mind. Because if it's 70%, if only about 30% in this part of the country attend church on a regular basis, you can imagine when you get into the large metropolitan cities of the north or the midwest or far out to California, uh, you, you can imagine that the percentage is much less than that. So we do need to send the light. I... Uh, as we were singing that, I thought about a story I heard many years ago, uh, and, and we do have some folks visiting this morning, and um, so they might be asking me this question after a service. Uh, a guy was visiting in a church one Sunday, and it was told for the truth, and whether it was or whether it's just a preacher's story, I, I don't know. It sounds like it could be one of both. But they sang, Rescue the Perishing. Care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. And the congregation sang it with as much gusto as you sang Send the Light a moment ago. And, and uh, as soon as the service was over, uh, this visitor hastened to one of the members and say, Well, and, and he said to them, Well, when do we go? And the guy said, When do we go where? When? He said, when do we go out to rescue the perishing? And the guy looked at him and said, sir, that's just a song. 
You know what the truth is? It is just a song. Because we do little to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, to snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Rarely do we weep over the erring one, lift up the fallen. Rarely do we tell them of Jesus, somebody to say. I better go back and look at these notes because I might ramble on here for another couple of hours. Uh, let me read something that I, I think this was yesterday. I have to read this little paragraph. I tell you, if you don't have this little book, uh, you're missing one of the great blessings as far as devotions are concerned in, uh, of your life. This was yesterday's devotion in Dr. Blackaby's book, and the scripture was Acts 26, 19, when Paul said, to that, said Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not obe disobedient. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And then Dr. Blackaby talks about when God saved Paul on the road to Damascus, how he told him all, of all the things that he was going to encounter, the suffering and so forth. And, uh, and then the last paragraph just gripped my soul yesterday. When he said, oh, to have Paul's tenacity and devotion to the Father's will. What joy there is not only to begin well in our Christian faith. But also to end faithfully. It is God's desire that each of us could say at the end of our lives, as did Paul, I was not disobedient. But let me go back. It is God's desire. It, it, what joy there is, not only to begin well in our Christian faith, but also to end faithfully. Boy. Isn't that what you want? To end not only to begin well, but to, but to end well. You know, I, I, you've got to be deaf and dumb and blind and spiritually speaking. If you do not understand this morning that America stands on the brink of God's judgment, it's inevitable. In fact, the truth is, it's already begun. And I could take this whole sermon this morning just to talk about what's happening in America. I mean, this election is, 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 is something else. It is, it's something else. You also know that I believe that we're standing on, in the shadow of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Peter said it's going to happen when, when men say, where's the promise of his coming? You Christians have been talking about this a long time. Why hasn't it happened yet? And that's the way the world's looking at us today. Well, let's put all of that aside this morning. Let's put aside the fact that judgment has begun and the second coming is we're living in the shadow of it, and I believe that. Put all of that aside this morning. What other reasons, Pastor, is there for men and women to become Christians? And what responsibility do you and I have to see that happens? Do we have a responsibility? <coughs> we don't act like it. We don't act like it. The first question that God asked of man was uh, when Adam and Eve had sinned. And, and <laughs> isn't it amazing? Uh, do you know when, when most of the wickedness and, and crime and sin and violence happens? You know when it happens? Hmm? 
Anybody know? Under the cover of dark. It's as if people think they, they can hide. You check the statistics, you'll find me true. I'm telling you the truth. And so Adam and Eve had committed this sin against God. You know, it, it, you know I, I, I mentioned this earlier. Isn't it amazing that people take the blessings of God and use them as a means to disobey and dishonor God? Now listen, I can stay here all day because I got tickets to the fish fry and they're going to be serving fish to 3 o'clock today. So I can just wait till the last minute and go, we eat, you know. So now y'all need to join me a little bit this morning. Adam, you know, people take the blessings of God and use them, and I could preach a sermon on that this morning. It's been bearing on my heart. <clears throat> to disobey, to dishonor, to try to escape God. And so God came that afternoon, and uh, God said, Adam, where art thou? Now, now, you know, God didn't have to ask that question. God wasn't asking Adam, where are you geographically? God knew where he was. He knew where he was hiding. But you know what God was getting at? Where are you now spiritually? Listen to me. If you don't get another word this morning, don't, don't escape this. Think about it. Where are you spiritually? Where are you in your relation to God this morning? If you don't get nothing else, you need, to, you need to let that sink in. Where are you spiritually this morning? And then the second question God asked was this. Cain had killed Abel, followed in the footsteps of his parents, disobeying God. And listen to me, and I could preach on this all morning because I really, this has really been on my heart the last couple of weeks. You know what's wrong with America? Children are following in the footsteps of their parents. That's where the trouble lies. And so Cain followed the footsteps of, of his dad, and he got jealous, and he took Abel's life. And then God came to him that day, and God said, well, where's your brother? <laughs> what did Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? You know what he was saying? God, I ain't responsible for him. If, listen to me. Don't be sanctimonious and sacrilegious and, and religious on a Sunday morning in the Baptist church. Be honest, because God knows what truth is. Cain was responsible to know something about his brother. You are responsible to know something about your brother and your sister and your aunt and your uncle. You are responsible. People talk about uh, Now you know when I do this, I'm getting ready to preach. I'm not like the old black preacher. <clears throat> Mama said, she, Mama said on the way, she said, she said, Bobby, I hope it's going to be warm in church this morning. I said, I think it will be, Mama. <laughs> I wasn't talking about me. I was just talking about when the weather's that hot out there. It's very difficult to get it controlled in here. It really is. Are you okay, Mama? You're fine. That's what's important. <coughs> I am responsible. And you know, whenever you talk about heaven, everybody wants to think about how wonderful it's going to be. Now, now follow me. Don't lose me. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Heaven's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a hallelujah time. I heard Richard say today, he had never seen as many names in the obituary column as he saw this past week, and I tend to agree with him. One day, I think the whole bottom of the hell was with names of people who had died. Well, that's death. So I mean, it's a lot of deaths right now. 
I think about our latest, Mr. Carl, how he must have rejoiced when he got to heaven. He saw those nail prints and so forth. But let me tell you something. That's only one side of that coin. I'm going to tell you something. Going to heaven scares me. It frightens me. Because one day I'm going to stand in the presence of holy God. And holy God is going to ask me to give an accounting of my life. And friend, I'm going to tell you something. It ain't pretty sometimes. I know all y'all are saints. <laughs> I'm fixing to get the Pope to saint sanctize some of you. You know. You know what the truth is? But God's going to say one day, the Bible says, so then shall every one of us give an account of himself to God. And I'm going to account for what I have done. And you are too. And I'm going to account for what I did as far as telling my brother or my sister or my aunt or my uncle about Jesus or my cousin or whomever. God holds me accountable and responsible. <coughs> I wanted to put that verse up. I, I'm, I'm going to be one of them big time preachers this, today. I asked Cindy, could I do this? Uh, I, I wish I was smart enough to hold one of them little flippers in my hand and flip it myself, but I ain't, you know. But I want you to see it. Didn't want you to hear me read it. I want you to see it. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. I won't read the rest of it. You can... Let it stay there just a minute, Wanda, so they can read. But do you, you see, the most important thing to him after he had discovered Jesus was to bring his brother to Jesus. Now, folks, that ought to speak a volume to all of us. The first thing he did when he discovered Jesus was to go find his brother and bring his brother to Jesus. And you know the interesting thing, and we could preach on this all day, you know the interesting thing? We don't know a lot about Andrew, do we? Follow me carefully. There's a very important lesson there. We don't know a lot about Andrew, but we know a doggone lot about Peter. What am I trying to say to you? You don't know when you bring someone to Jesus how he's going to turn out. You think about that little... You think about that little old 12 year old boy, scrawny little old fella, dairy farmer's son. He walked down that sawdust trail in that tent meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mordecai Ham was preaching. You know what some of those people? <laughs> that little old kid, he probably won't amount to any more than a dairy farmer the rest of his life. And he turned out to be the greatest evangelist. Besides Peter in the history of the Christian church. You don't know what your brother might become. You don't know what your sister might become. You don't know what your cousin might become. You don't know what your uncle might become or your aunt might become. It's not your responsibility to decide what they'll become. It's your responsibility to bring them to Jesus. Amen. <sighs> This thing just beat me up this week. <laughs> because I'm going to bring that next scripture up. Because uh, Bring that next scripture up. If you want to know whether you're responsible or not, read this one. Ezekiel. <laughs> Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people. <coughs> and say to them, when I bring the sword upon the land... <coughs> And the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees a sword coming upon the land, if he blows a trumpet and warns the people, whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and take him away, takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. 
He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That's, that's scary. That's scary. I couldn't get away this week as I worked on this sermon. I, I could tell you a lot of stories. My own failures. You need to think about your failures. I had an uncle when I was growing up. He, uh, he was divorced, and divorce back in those days was very, very rare. He was a little short fellow. Somehow he picked up the name Samson, and I called him Uncle Sam. He worked in the cotton mills alongside so many others in those days. And, and then when the mill closed... He uh, opened a little community grocery store. And I went over there the other day. Store's gone. Church has been abandoned. It. I was baptized in it. I told Mary, I'm going to find some way to revive that church. Well, how? I think God wants it revived, Randy. God doesn't want his churches abandoned, just left to vandals to destroy. But I stopped right where that little store once was. It's been torn down. And I stood there and I had my walk down memory lane. Uncle Sam was good to me. He lived with my grandmother. I went off to school. I'd come home every weekend because I was preaching somewhere. I never left to go back to Wingate College. My Uncle Samp, I'd go by and see him. And my Uncle Samp w- would put a $5 bill in my hand. <laughs> you say, that ain't much. 50 years ago, <laughs> a $5 bill was a whole lot of money. He helped educate me. Finished over there and came to be pastored. Calvary Baptist Church in Rock Hill. I'll never forget that Sunday afternoon. That's, that's when churches were vibrant and alive and had Sunday night like they did Sunday morning. I had an office up on the second floor right above the auditorium. And I was sitting there getting ready for the evening service and the phone rang. And my dear, dear friend, Milford Vaughn, who was pastor at West End Baptist Church at that time, He said, Ray, I hate to call you and tell you at this time, but your Uncle Sam had a heart attack and died. Boy. You know what made it so bad? As good as my Uncle Sam had been to me and anybody else, Uncle Sam had a problem drinking sometimes. I can still see somebody coming to Granny's house, which was about two or three houses down from the store, and they'd say, Ms. Long, Sam's drinking. If you don't get up there and stop him, he's going to give the store away. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there are five kinds of liquor. Do you know what they are? There's a kind that makes you generous. That's what it did to Uncle Sam. He just got generous. He wanted to give everything away. There's a kind that makes you mean as the devil, and that's the kind my dad drank. I don't know whether they label that on the shelves or not. I have, had no idea. And I can't remember all five of them, but I can tell you I've witnessed there are five different kinds of liquor. Affects people in different ways. But my Uncle Sam got generous, and he wanted to give everything to everybody. But you know what broke my heart? As good as he was. As far as I know, Uncle Sam's in hell today because he never 
gave his life to Jesus. Yeah, I am a Baptist preacher. But I must be honest, I never made the kind of effort that I should have made to ensure that my Uncle Sam came to know Jesus. And some of you sitting here this morning looking at me and sort of story-eyed, you too have those stories you could tell. You hear me? Time's about gone. I've got three more pages left. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You have to get this. You're responsible. That bothers me more than ever. L listen to me. Let, me. let me say a couple other things and I'll finish. I was sitting about two Sunday nights ago. I was watching some of the TV shows, programs, different churches around. It's pastor of one of the larger churches, Baptist Church. He made a statement that just, it just, oh, it gripped me. I didn't mean to call him, drop him a little note and tell him how it impacted me. But I think I've got it almost word for word. He said, in speaking to his large congregation on that Sunday previous to that, he said, our assuming that a person is saved is responsible for many a person going to hell. Did you hear me? Boy, that just grabbed my heart. Our assuming that people are saved is responsible for sending many a person to hell. You can't assume it. You can't assume somebody else is saved. Have you ever asked them? You ever ask your son, son, you're saved? I asked one of my sons recently. And do you know what his answer was? Do you know what my son's answer was? Anybody want to guess? No, you know what his answer was? He said, Daddy, don't you remember? You baptized me. You know what I said to my son? But son, you aren't living like that. You aren't behaving like that. We need a conversation. Listen to me carefully. Don't forget this. We need to sit down with our families and we need to have some conversations about their relationship to God through Jesus. Let me tell you how to begin it. I'll tell you how to begin it. First of all, most important of all, you make dead sure. John said, these things are written that ye might guess whether or not you have eternal life. He didn't say that. John said, these things are written that you might know beyond any shadow of a doubt. Paul said, I know whom I have believed in. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know! I know! I know! I know! Do you know? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt if you drop dead today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? You know what you need to do? Sit down this week. Get along with God. It's you and God. Not you and the television. It's you and God. And take your, take your, a pad and write down as best you can remember when you came to know Jesus. Are you listening to me? Listen to me, church. I love you. If 
I didn't, I wouldn't preach like this. A couple of folks told me this week you need to stay home Sunday. For what reason? Let's get everybody else infected and get all the doctors rich. <laughs> oh, I'm not that stupid. I just can't stay away. I just can't stay away. Sit down somewhere, just you and God. Just as best you can remember, you write down in black and white your own personal testimony of how you came to know Jesus as your Savior. That's the beginning point. Because you can't share something you don't have. I can't share millions of dollars with you. You know why? I ain't got it. But you know what? If you got Jesus, you can share Jesus. Miss Debbie was telling me about her doctor. She's going to sell her PMC at uh, Not PMC. God forgive me. Uh, CMC. Uh, I tell people about him every day. My neighbor asked me the other day, he said, hey, you've had this heart operation, yeah? He's having a little bit of problems. I said, let me tell you something. The man that you need to go see is Dr. Watts. He is the best of the best. I stake everything on that man. I didn't have no problem with that, did I? You know what? I have a friend named Jesus. He's the best of the best of the best. I should be as anxious to tell people about my Jesus as about my heart, doctor. Amen? Amen. Amen. Ain't that right? Yeah. I tell people almost every day about it. They'll ask me, who operated on you? I said, the best of the best. Dr. Watts. He's, he's pretty blunt. Told me I was a man of average intelligence. Made me mad. <laughs> so, man, don't tell me I'm a man of average intelligence. I'm a man of super intelligence. <laughs> Insulted me. That's what he's talking about. Just straightforward. Just right up front. But I want to tell you something. He knows what he's doing. He knows. I trust him. Jesus knows what he's doing. I trust him. And l- listen to me. Here's what I want you to do. I want every one of you to start praying like you've never prayed. God, give me a passion for somebody that I can tell about Jesus. And you know where he'll begin with you? In your home. Are you listening? And you know what? When you start praying and God gives you that compassion, I will tell you something. You say it's hard. It is. But you know what? That might be Donald Trump calling me. You know something? (laughs) Sent me a Christmas card, so just give me give me a telephone call. If God gives you a burden for somebody, God will open the door for you to share. You don't you don't have to. Listen, you don't have to wave a Bible in front of them all the time, but you've got to live the Bible. You can't live like hell and expect you to be able to tell them about heaven. Right? You can't live like hell and then expect them to believe you when you start talking about heaven. You've got to live it. So two things. Start living it. Be salt and light. And you know what? You know, I believe this. I, God put that Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen on my heart. Next week I'm gonna give you some to keep you keep you reminded every day. I believe God wants to do something with us. I certainly love every I love every Baptist church around. Now the Presbyterians and Methodists will put to my back burner. I love all Christians, born again. Let me tell you something. This is the place God put me. This is where I'm responsible. Amen? Amen. This is where you're responsible. And I believe God can take us 
In 2 Chronicles 7 14, along with a passion for souls. We, uh, the other Sunday, we baptized seven people. You know what the truth is? We ought to baptize seven every Sunday. Because there's that many people out there who yet know Jesus. Amen. And most of the people, and I close with this, most of the people that I have baptized in all my years of baptizing people, most of them I did not win to Jesus. You know why? Because you know what? People expect the pastor to do it. In fact, you know what a lot of you members expect? What in the world is he talking about? Man, we pay him a good salary to do that for us. <laughs> you can't pay me to do that for you. I can't pay somebody to do it for me. I am personally responsible for my personal witness. Right? I'm responsible for it. And you know, God can use us. There are enough lost people right here that you know that we could baptize somebody every single Sunday if we were witnessing. You've got, you know what, if I, if I went home today and I close, if I went home today and I got a telephone call from someone in my family to tell me that someone in my family had cancer. Do you know the first thing I'd do? What do you think the first thing I'd do is? I, mm -mm. I would cry like a baby. And then I'd start praying. Right? They're lost. Have we prayed? Have we cried over? He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing himself with him. I will never forget, and I do close now. I'll never forget that day. It's been a long time ago. I will never forget it. When I had to tell one of my sons, he came in from work, came by our house to pick up his truck where he had left, dropped it off that day for a buddy that was riding with a buddy to his Hendersonville, North Carolina, to work. Long story. My boy came in. I said, son, I got some bad news for you. And he said, what's it, Dad? I said, your wife's left you. It's like death. I literally lay down in the floor and wept until I didn't have any tears left. Are you listening to me? I ought to weep just as hard. Listen to me, church. I ought to weep, ought to weep just as hard over my sons who don't know Jesus as I wept over my son when I knew that his wife wasn't coming. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? And I've kept asking myself the question this week, when's the last time you really wept over somebody's relationship to God? Bow with me. Denise, I just want you to play something for me. We're not going to sing, but while she's playing, Play something real softly. But while she's playing for a couple of minutes, I want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to ask God to show you who you can witness to or you should witness to. And then I want you to pray that God will give you a burden like you've never had, a burden that's so intense that you'll weep. You'll turn the television off and you'll pray and weep. And you know what? If you do that... God is bound by his word. God is bound by his word to honor his word and to give you an answer to that prayer. Amen. Boy, God, verse that I didn't get around to sharing. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that everybody, underline that, everybody should come to faith and repentance in his son Jesus. And I've added a couple of words. So just pray. Just pray. 
Just pray, just pray. Oh, God, give me a burden. Give me a burden for my son. Give me a burden for my daughter. Give me a burden for my grandchildren. Oh, boy, I pray for my grandchildren every day. But do I pray with a burden? Have I shed tears? Let me weep. Let me weep. Let me weep. Let me weep. Rich man in hell said, I've got five brothers. Let Abraham or someone go and tell them. You know what? It's too late. Don't wait too late. Almost thou persuadest me. Paul Agrippa said to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, almost is not enough. In fact, that's a song. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. And then there's a song, and I couldn't think of the words this morning as I began to work, go back over the sermon again and again. Too late. Too late. Father, I know, I know with all of my heart this week, you have spoken to me. And I'm praying you'll give me a burden like I've never had before for lost people. Let it begin with my family and sons, the grandsons who need Jesus. People I know, some in this congregation who come regularly and they're great people. They've never told me how they came to know Jesus. I pray the Spirit of God would become so real in this place, Lord, that instead of talking about the weather, instead of talking about politics of the Panthers, we'll start telling each other what Jesus means to us. And the excitement of that, the excitement of that, Father, the Holy Spirit would just energize us. The excitement of all of it would spread through this community. There's a group of people who care more than about politics or weather, the Panthers. They care about Jesus, and they care about people's relationship to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, Father, I believe, would begin to bring those people to us. Do that for your glory and for your honor. Father, I pray for Miss Debbie. She and Bobby are so special, and I know there are a lot of sick folks. But she's facing something, Father, rather serious. And that doctor examines her on Tuesday. And he begins to diagnose her heart condition. I pray for grace on top of grace, on top of grace for her and Bobby. And I pray for wisdom on top of wisdom, on top of wisdom. And I pray for those doctors. They too will have the wisdom to know what treatments what treatments, Father, they need to use to make her completely whole again. And Lord, I want to thank you for that. Just felt impressed to pray that. Because Lord, I believe that's what you want us as family to do. Again, we rejoice when something good happens with us. But Lord, we weep when a brother or sister is in a condition where weeping is appropriate. Lord, thank you for this church. I'm excited, God, about what you're going to do. And I pray, Lord, if there's somebody leaving here today who's never given their life to Christ, they may have joined the church, may have even been baptized, but they've never confessed their sin, repented of that sin, and let Jesus come in to be Lord and Savior. I pray they'll do it, and they'll do it right away in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing, Greg will lead us in singing now. Benediction.